You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is September 8, 2017, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, exercise-induced bronchoconstriction. Our presenter is Dr. Chris Randolph. He's a clinical professor at the Yale-affiliated programs in Waterbury, Connecticut. Okay, we're going to get started with the second hour of COLA this morning, um, <laughs> September 8th, 2017. And for our second hour, we're pleased to have Dr. Chris Randolph um, from Yale uh, talk to us um, about exercise-induced um, asthma and exercise-induced bronchospasm. And um, um, we're going to let him take it away. Okay, so I'll get started. Thank you, and thank you for the opportunity to speak to your group. Um, I'm honored. Um, so I'm going to talk about the pathogenesis, diagnosis, and management of exercise-induced bronchoconstriction. We don't refer to it as exercise-induced asthma because you don't need to exercise to have the asthma, and we'll talk about that. I have no financial disclosures relevant to this presentation, um, and our objectives are to, to I have you understand the diag pathogenesis, diagnosis, and management of two different types of EIB. I'll be referring to EIB, exercise-induced bronchoconstriction. And that's known asthma with EIB um, or EIB with asthma and uh, EIB alone without known asthma, which we see in competitive athletes. So two different types of EIB, one with asthma, which is the most common presentation, uh, anywhere from 30 to 90% of individuals with asthma will have EIB. And EIB alone without known asthma, which has an incidence of 10 to 20% in the general community, uh, and uh, higher and up to 50% uh, in the elite athlete community. And this, of course, is the prelude. These are the, the Rio Olympics. And this is our goal uh, in management of EIB is, yes, we can, that all athletes should be able to safely participate uh, in sports, um, even if they have EIB. So EIB alone, EIB is defined as a transient increase in airway resistance and narrowing following vigorous exercise. EIA, which was previously used, is really EIB and is the major phenotype reflecting known asthma. And it is defined by a decline in FEV1 by greater than or equal to 10% following strenuous exercise, usually six to eight minutes of strenuous aerobic exercise. Uh, that this could be a free running test, it could be a sports related test, it could be a treadmill, it could be an exercise bike, and we now have surrogate uh, forms of a listening uh, EIB, uh, which we will talk about, eucapnic voluntary hyperventilation. 50% or more asthmatics and up to 90% will have EIB. 40 to 50% of individuals with allergic rhinitis in a, in a just published study from Lilly, France, of uh, an athletic center, a soccer group, uh, 16 to, to 24 year olds, median age 24, 16% uh, of, uh, of these soccer athletes, competitive athletes had EIB by uh, EVH by uh, surrogate testing. 50% um, of them had positive prick tests to at least one inhalant allergen. Uh, and only 28% had a history of EIB. And we'll talk more about that. So the diagnosis of EIB, as we'll talk about, is made by spirometry, pre and post bronchodilator, or by an exercise challenge. Up to 50% of elite athletes, 43% of healthy competitive college athletes, and 20, up to 20% of school children uh, will have EIB. Uh, there is morbidity associated with it and mortality that's been reported largely related to poorly controlled asthma. 
EIB in individuals with asthma is often the earliest sign of asthma, and it's the last to go away when you have an asthma exacerbation, and it's reflective of underlying asthma control. We have case of a 10-year-old Hispanic male soccer player with known asthma, has cough and wheezing five minutes after running for five to 10 minutes, and this is the typical five minute, uh, it's usually, usually up to six to eight minutes of challenge, uh, followed by within five to 10 minutes by a decline in FEV1 by 10% or more. So this is EIB with asthma. The second case is an 18-year-old white female soccer player has exertional dyspnea with a baseline FEV1 72% in response to bronchodilator. Is this EIB with asthma? I'm asking the audience. Yes. Okay, so 19-year-old white female runner has syncope post-exercise, not during exercise, which would be cardiac, but post. And there's a history of coughing or wheezing with respiratory illness, possible asthma, FEV1, 73%, EIB with asthma. So these are cases of EIB with asthma, which is the most common form of EIB you will see uh, in the officer clinic. Now, EIB in the athlete is a different uh, entity and probably is an injury, uh, an overuse syndrome. This is without known asthma and, and normal pulmonary functions at baseline and different pathology and variable response to inhaled steroids. 11 to 50% of lead athletes have it. You have a 21-year-old white female competitive distance runner has chest tightness, cough, and or wheezing with, only with prolonged running in cold air. Um, we have just submitted a, a, a poster, an abstract to the college um, where we screened individuals who, uh, with a history uh, for EIB um, who, had, um, uh, who had normal pre and post bronchodilator um, spirometry, uh, so no known asthma, and 22% of them had a positive EVH challenge. So 22% of them uh, with a history of EIB uh, had a positive challenge. This is one of the uh, uh, most uh, original and comprehensive researchers who, uh, uh, who was one of the writers of the uh, guidelines, um, the, the exercise-induced bron bronchoconstriction guidelines were published in, in 11, 16, and uh, 9, 16 in the JACI, uh, the Steel Health Strand. Um, what we see here on the left is the exercise challenge. Uh, within five minutes of, of six to eight minutes of exercise, uh, there is a decline in FEV1 by uh, more than 10%. And there is a response to beta agonist, and albuterol is still the primary mode of treatment of EIB that is mild and intermittent. If one looks at a, a, a hyperpolarized helium view of the airway during exercise asthma, what, exercise-induced bronchoconstriction, one sees areas of bronchoconstriction and closure uh, of the airway in different segments of the lung, and one sees inflammation. So EIB is bronchoconstriction with inflammation. How does this, what is the pathogenesis? Well, the pathogenesis is thought to be um, related to water transfer. Uh, the hyperventilation leads to drying of the airways and leads to a hyperosmolar environment. Um, the, uh, there is then compensation for the lower airway uh, lo loss of heat and water and transfer of heat or water to the, uh, I'm sorry, there is transfer of heat and water to the upper airway uh, where water loss has occurred. Uh, the, the process leads to a hyperosmolar environment uh, with the water loss. Uh, and, and this leads to mast cell degranulation um, and histamine and cystineoleukotriene release, as well as prostaglandins. Uh, uh, the uh, histamine and tryptase uh, and cystineoleukotrienes parallel the drop in FEV1, uh, as one can see here, pre and post uh, exercise. Uh, one can find in the airway um, of individuals with uh, uh, exercise induced bronchoconstriction, shedding of epithelial cells uh, in the sputum, uh, and high levels of cystineoleukotriene, low levels of PGDE, uh, PGD2, which is a myorelaxant. Um, 
and um, uh, uh, very high levels of mast cell uh, and eosinophil influx into the airway. Uh, there appears to be a genetic component to EIB. Uh, Halstrand, in his work, looked at mast cell genes that were differentially overexpressed in EIB, and these were predominantly tryptase and carboxypeptidase, uh, and these paralleled uh, the, uh, the onset of EIB. Um, so this is sort of a comprehensive view of uh, an illustration of pathogenesis of EIB. You have exercise-induced water loss with cooling and dehydration. Uh, we think that the, that the epithelial cells probably stimulate the production of what is called um, uh, phospholipase A2 and X um, uh, in the airway um, and fire off the arachidonic acid pathway in the adjacent leukocytes. And in turn, uh, the cooling of the airway leads to mast cell degranulation with release of, of cisneal leukotrienes and prostaglandins. Uh, with an imbalance of cisneal leukotrienes uh, over prostaglandins leading to bronchoconstriction. Eosinophils are also activated in the process uh, and release further cisneal leukotrienes. So you have a massive uh, production of cisneal leukotrienes predominantly as mediators in EIB as opposed to asthma in general. All of these mediators, of course, then act on the basement membrane uh, and on the uh, bronchial uh, uh, muscle, and you have bronchoconstriction and inflammation. And they also fire off the sensory nerves, which fire retrograde and a release of neurokinin A, which leads to mucus production and bronchospasm. So this is a biochemical and uh, neur neuronal pathway, if you will, to EIB. Um, so the key events are a susceptible patient population. Uh, there appears to be a genetics to this in terms of at least the mast cell activation in the airway. Uh, exercise causes water transfer out of the airway. Uh, mast cell and eosinophils release mediators. And then your sensory nerves mediate smooth muscle contraction and mucus release. The epithelium uh, may serve as a regulator of the leukocyte activation via the phospholipase A2 and X2. Um, and this is the clinical outcome, if you will, or the pulmonary function outcome uh, with EIB. Um, you have an exercise for a period of five to eight minutes. Then you have, within five minutes, the decline in FEV1 um, uh, to uh, usually in, in 70 percent or more of candidates uh, within five to ten minutes. But the uh, decline can occur all the way out to 30 minutes in the in the other um, 30% of candidates. And then uh, about four to eight hours later, there is a second uh, uh, episode of bronchial constriction and, and drop in FEV1, probably related to cellular influx and release of mediators from the eosinophils, mast cells, um, leukocytes, uh, including T cells. The first component of EIB that is unique to EIB as opposed to asthma in general is that the cisneal leukotriene uh, production is uh, massively uh, dominant over the, uh, the histamine, tryptase, carboxypeptidase, and certainly over the prostaglandins, which appear to be diminished, at least PGE2. And the second, and the, uh, second uh, uh, differentiation from EIB and asthma is that the late phase that I just showed you um, is not predictable in all cases with EIB as it is with asthma. The third difference is that EIB is susceptible to a refractory period. This means that your, your uh, uh, in candidate for EIB uh, can uh, continue to exercise for a period of uh, up to 60 minutes, 60 or 70 minutes, and the drop in FEV1 will be less and less, as you can see here. Um, and this is presumed to be doing due to the fact that you probably activate prostaglandin pathway and PGE2, the myorelaxin, is probably produced in increasing quantities um, as you exercise repeatedly. And this leads to a refractory period uh, where you no longer respond to exercise. So EIB is, uh, differentiates from asthma in general 
uh, by the predominance of cisneoleukotrienes in the uh, in the mediator mix, uh, by the uh, s somewhat unpredictable late phase, and by the refractory period. And so we can use this refractory period for therapy. Uh, proper warm-up and cool-down will prevent or reduce the incidence of exercise-induced, it should say, bronchospasm or bronchoconstriction. And, and uh, uh, there are numerous studies that we'll allude to later looking at uh, short sprints for periods of 20 to 30 seconds um, to all the way to 3 to 30, even 30-minute 30 um, warm-ups uh, at 40 to 50 to 60 percent of maximum heart rate. Uh, before you actually do the exercise, and this leads to attenuation of the drop in FEV1. So warm-ups and cool-downs um, can help attenuate the fall in FEV1 and the respiratory discomfort with exercise. What is the prevalence of uh, EIB? Well, we said up to 90% of asthmatics can have, and I've just illustrated that in uh, a typical sports team, about 16%, but in elite athletes, up to 50%. Uh, in allergic rhinitis patients, up to 50%. Uh, and in uh, general, uh, the general population, uh, particularly pediatric, it's 10 to 20%. Uh, it's more severe when there's, when there's less controlled asthma or more severe asthma. Remember that EIB is a reflection of underlying asthma control. And the factors in the prevalence will vary with the history. Uh, the type of challenge, um, so a challenge with a treadmill uh, or free running is more asthmogenic uh, than, uh, than a, a cycle because it, uh, uh, it exercises upper and lower airway. Um, the conditions of the challenge uh, are recommended to be dry air because we think that dry air probably precipitates uh, the uh, hyperosmolar environment that leads to mast cell degranulation and to EIB. Uh, so the, the drier the conditions um, uh, during the challenge, the, the better. Um, the population varies, of course, by age, um, gender, um, and somewhat by ethnicity, although this is not consistent. Um, and there is no consensus on what a positive response to a challenge is although it is more common with asthma and in elite athletes than the general population. The presentation is generally one typical of asthma with cough and wheezing, chest pain and or chest tightness, as well as a very common post-race cough in elite athletes. In young children, it can be a very uh, murky uh, and, and not a very definitive picture with uh, even sore throat and stomach ache. Um, Dyspnea alone is usually not uh, asthma and certainly not EIB. Uh, in a beautiful study by Weinberger and colleagues at Iowa, uh, they took individuals age 8 uh, to uh, 24 uh, with Dyspnea alone and put them on treadmills, and the only 8% of them had EIB. The, the rest had, as you might guess, um, uh, poor conditioning. Um, with rare uh, other differentials, which included vocal cord dysfunction or psychogenic um, entities. How is the diagnosis made of EIB? Uh, well, this is a survey of, the, of our college uh, colleagues, um, and 70% of them used history and symptoms alone. Only 10% used an exercise test, 3% used a medication test, and 5% used lung function and test and spirometry. And what we're going to discuss is that uh, the uh, history alone, self-reported history, is not reliable. Rundell, Parsons, and numerous other investigators have, um, have uh, definitively uh, illustrated this. Uh, Parsons indicated that 36% prevalence of EIB in asymptomatic athletes, and the same prevalence, almost identical prevalence, 35% in symptomatic athletes. If you take high ventilation sports, uh, they tend to be more symptomatic than low. And in a study from, done by Kaiser Permanente, 19% uh, of patients referred with asthma symptoms with exercise uh, were diagnosed with EIB by an exercise challenge. Uh, so uh, the history alone is not reliable. Um, 
So how is diagnosis made? Diagnosis is made by changes in pulmonary function pre and post bronchodilator as we do with asthma in general. Uh, one in, has the inference of EIB if you can document uh, and define asthma uh, by um, pre and post bronchodilator uh, changes in FEV1. The second, uh, if, if there is no change with bronchodilator, uh, then the, uh, an exercise challenge is recommended, uh, and this can be either uh, a challenge with a treadmill, bike, sport, or free running, um, uh, or um, and, and this is uh, or with these with surrogate challenges, uh, mannitol uh, was available in the U.S. Uh, but is no longer available as a surrogate. Uh, but eucapnic voluntary hyperpnea (EVH) uh, is available commercially, um, and we'll discuss this. Um, the exercise challenge is done for six to eight minutes with 85% maximum heart rate and pulmonary function monitoring every five to 30 minutes post-exercise. This is the uh, practice parameter published by Weiler uh, and uh, other editors, including myself and John Brannon. Um, and it has an algorithm uh, that uh, indicates that when you have symptoms suggestive of VIB, that you perform spirometry. And if the FEV1 is greater than or equal to 70%, um, and you administer a bronchodilator, uh, and, and you get a uh, definitive response for asthma, then you have made the diagnosis of EIB. Uh, similarly, with FEV1s less than 70%, if you get a response to bronchodilator, you've diagnosed uh, EIB along with asthma. Now, if you have a, a candidate who does not respond to bronchodilator, and if FEV1 is greater than or equal to 70%, they can then have an exercise challenge uh, of the variety that I've mentioned. Um, if the individual has an FEV1 less than 70% uh, and does not respond to bronchodilator, then you have a very long differential diagnosis of, of exercise um, uh, pathophysiology, exercise-induced laryngeal dysfunction, uh, which requires a flow volume loop and exercise rhinolaryngoscopy, um, exercise-induced hyperventilation, obstructive restrictive diseases, obesity and skeletal defects, exercise-induced anaphylaxis, um, uh, cardiopulmonary or gastrointestinal mechanisms uh, for breathlessness, uh, and uh, which mandate echocardiography and cardiopulmonary testing. Um, and uh, even mitochondrial enzyme deficiencies, and of course the the uh, psychological um, reactions. The exercise challenge test is done with a treadmill, uh, which is the preferential test for an exercise challenge, is with a rapid increase in work over two to three minutes with target ventilation or heart rate um, achieved greater than 85% of maximum heart rate. Uh, in, ad in adults and children greater than or 95 percent of predicted heart rate and at 40 to 60 percent of maximum ventilation and they should be sustain this uh, level of performance with greater than 85 to 95 percent predicted heart rate for uh, uh, six minutes um, and they should be inspiring dry air uh, for the reasons we discussed that the pathogenesis of uh, EIB uh, is the um, uh, inhalation of dry uh, air, uh, which leads to the hyperosmolar environment and degranulation of your mast cells and firing off of mast cell and eosinophil mediators and bronchoconstriction and inflammation. Ambient temperature should be less than 25 degrees centigrade. And this is an illustration of this, uh, of a typical treadmill test here. Um, We've said that exercise-induced dyspnea, um, when you put individuals on a treadmill who only have exercise-induced dyspnea, that, you're, uh, that only 8% of them have EIB with asthma, and the remainder are largely uh, uh, poor conditioning uh, with rare uh, vocal cord dysfunction or uh, tachyarrhythmias, SVT, or GERD. Now, the surrogate testing for EIB is done currently uh, with eucapnic voluntary hyperventilation. Uh, this is a procedure that you can see in the uh, illustration here uh, where you have a tank 
uh, with 5% CO2, 75% nitrogen, 20% oxygen, uh, and the uh, and they connected by a flow meter uh, and a reservoir uh, to the uh, pulmonary function equipment, um, and the patient breathes through a one-way Rudolph valve at 30 times FEV1 for six minutes. Uh, and this hyperventilation, if you will, uh, is kept eucapnic, so the, pa the patient is kept from dropping their, FE their CO2, uh, which could lead to syncope, uh, by use of the, uh, the CO2 in the tank. Um, and we get a drop in FEV1 by 10% or more, and we have the diagnosis of, e of uh, EIB. Um, now, post-challenge, we, we do serial measurements of lung function at um, 0, 3, 6, 10, 15, and 30 minutes. Uh, and we look for um, a uh, function in the DAR that usually is within 5 to 10 minutes. And this is a typical uh, diagram of the airway response to the challenge. And you have a fall in, in FEV1 uh, that occurs about five minutes um, after uh, the exercise for six to eight minutes. Um, and would remain, uh, the fall in FEV1 would continue uh, for a period of somewhere between 30 minutes and 90 minutes if there is no treatment. EVH, unfortunately, is not a gold standard. It detects moderate to severe airway hyperresponsiveness, um, but its negative predictive value is its greatest asset. Um, beautiful studies uh, done in uh, English uh, elite runners uh, demonstrated that uh, uh, EVH uh, was positive in 75% of these elite runners, distance runners, um, whereas uh, uh, about 25% of the runners had a history. Um, so uh, EVH is clearly very sensitive. It is like the methacholine, uh, as one of my colleagues said, the methacholine challenge test for EIB, um, except that methacholine is not, is not uh, sensitive for EIB. It does, however, have wide sensitivity and specificity indices and poor reproducibility in the mild to moderate case. Um, so it precludes inclusion as a gold standard, although EVH is used as the gold standard in Europe uh, and by the International Olympic Committee um, for our Olympic athletes uh, for induction of uh, EIB or, or for diagnosis of EIB. Persons attempting to find a motive in this narrative will be prosecuted. Persons attempting to find a moral will be banished. Persons attempting to find a plot will be shot by order of the author, Mark Twain, who I believe is a neighbor of yours there in, in the Kansas City area. Um, and in summary, EIB occurs in a very distinct group of subjects. Uh, there, there clearly appears to be at least a genetics uh, related to the mast cell uh, number and response. Um, and this is under uh, current uh, vigorous investigation. Um, uh, studies in uh, Dallas uh, and at, uh, at, in Seattle are ongoing, uh, looking at the genetics of EIB. Um, there's mast cell infiltration of the airway epithelium. Challenge tests are useful to detect EIB uh, with a sustained high ventilation for six minutes of dry air and airway response in this following challenge. So these tests for EIB are important so to, to diagnose EIB, treat asthma, uh, and for therapies uh, for indirect uh, airway hyperresponsiveness. How do we manage EIB? EIB alone, uh, the efficacy of therapy is not well established. Um, it, it, there is uh, evidence level uh, B to D, uh, and, and you can find this all discussed in the practice parameter published in JSCI uh, in, um, in 9 uh, and 11, 16. Um, the limitation of exercise to less than or equal to 20 hours a week and cross-training um, uh, eliminates the EIB uh, in the elite athlete. Um, there is uh, pre-medication, and we have level A evidence for that. Um, we'll discuss that. 
And what about EIB with asthma? Well, EIB with asthma is treated as asthma is in general, um, with the exception that there are non-pharmaceutical interventions. We talked about warm-up pre-exercise, um, reduction of sodium intake to 1,500 milligrams a day for a period of two to four weeks prior to the exercise challenge will reduce the fall in FEV1. Fish oil, five to six grams, two to four weeks, starting two to four weeks before the challenge, uh, will also reduce FEV1 and in, in, in improve recovery. Ascorbic acid, 500 to 1,500 milligrams again, a day, again, for two to four weeks, will also uh, have impact on FEV1. And then the therapy for EIV with asthma is otherwise similar to asthma in general. Uh, beta agonists being the primary mode of treatment uh, with 100% efficacy. Um, uh, and uh, then uh, marching on to uh, inhaled steroids and leukotriene modifiers in the individual with chronic asthma. Um, uh, Non-steroidals uh, such as Intol and Chromalin are uh, Intol and uh, and docromil are highly effective, uh, but are not available in the U.S. So here is a, a typical sort of algorithm for the individual with uh, dyspnea, cough, and wheezing, and chest tightness during or after exercise that is not cardiac related. Um, FEV1 is done, um, and, um, and, and and an indirect challenge is done, um, and. Uh, with either dry air, exercise, eucapnic voluntary hyperventilation, or in other countries of the world, mannitol. And it's positive, so we have EIB, and we manage with a short-acting beta agonist as needed. If this, this is, there's not sufficient clinical improvement, then we go to the inhaled corticosteroids, which are the defining treatment for EIB uh, in the competitive athlete uh, uh, who has chronic asthma. Um, and the addition of a leukotriene modifier on a subject-by-subject -subject basis has been found to be uh, more efficacious in conjunction with the inhaled steroid in both adults and children, and we'll show that data. Um, so this is the competitive athlete with EIB alone, um, and this is the, one of the many studies that uh, illustrate that uh, management of, by limitation of exercise uh, and cross-training uh, is uh, efficacious uh, when uh, uh, in elite swimmers, uh, when the uh, the limitation of exercise is to less than 20 hours a week, uh, and cross training occurs, uh, EIB is eliminated uh, in this population. Uh, pre medication is another uh, available modality that has great A evidence. Um, the, uh, this is a study with monolucast uh, administered uh, two hours prior to uh, exercise challenge, um, and you can see that the challenge is evaluated, um, is, is done with exercise uh, and with uh, EVH, and in both cases, uh, the uh, mon monolucast uh, is uh, efficacious in reducing the fall in FEV1, whether you measure it uh, by whether the challenge is done with EVH or the challenge is done with a um, uh, with exercise. The second uh, modality that uh, may be used for treatment is, is beclomethasone. And in, in this study uh, by the uh, Australian group, um, Kippel and, and colleagues, uh, beclomethasone is given 1,500 micrograms uh, four hours before the challenge and one can see that there is a, um, a, a reduction in the fall in FEV1 um, with the uh, beclomethasone, uh, whether it, uh, the induction is by exercise or with EVH. Chromalin is also effective, uh, 40 milligrams administered 10 minutes before uh, 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 exercise challenge, and these are all placebo-controlled trials. Um, here is the chromalin, and again, chromalin completely blocks the fall in FEV1. So uh, we say chromalin is a complete pharmaceutical therapy uh, for uh, EIB. On the other hand, uh, as Montelukas uh, is a is a um, uh, is has pharmaceutical impact. 
uh, that is, it reduces the fall in FEV1 by 50%, uh, but does not um, but does not block the fall completely as chromalin does. So therapy, therapeutic approach to EIB with known asthma would be uh, first uh, education of the athlete and trainers and avoidance, warm up, warm down. Uh, I have not discussed facial mass uh, and nasal breathing. These would both provide moisture to the airway um, and uh, have been used effectively uh, with the competitive athletes. Um, and PRN beta agonists. So you start with albuterol and it is administered 15 minutes prior to exercise. If not improved, one can add chromalin if it is available for a puff just prior to exercise. And again, if, if one does not have sufficient improvement, uh, one can add the inhaled steroids, leukotriene modifiers, and uh, LAVA's long-acting beta agonists are really only added uh, in the context where you have chronic asthma that is moderate to severe. And, that, and this is because the, the continuous administration of beta agonist therapy leads to tachyphylaxis. Um, uh, and we'll talk about that more uh, in the later slide. Um, Ebertropium is helpful on a subject-by-subject -subject basis, but is not very consistent. Uh, and the evidence for Ebertropium's effectiveness here is, is weak, um, level uh, D. Um, Evaluation and therapy for inhalant allergy is critical for all uh, individuals with EIB. As I indicated uh, in my opening discussion, 50% uh, of uh, soccer athletes in Lille, France uh, Sports Center um, who, who had uh, EIB uh, documented by EVH um, had um, uh, positive skin tests uh, to inhalants. Um, so, um, it is critical um, to evaluate and then treat, and the treatment, of course, would be nasal steroids, um, which would be uh, effective in keeping the airway, nasal airway open so the, n the nose can humidify air and mitigate uh, EIB. So critical that you have the appropriate inhalant therapy uh, in conjunction with your um, your therapy for the lower airway with uh, inhaled steroids. Um, and of course, avoidance of the uh, inhalant allergen wherever possible. Um, training to improve cardiovascular status. Um, and if all of these measures are done uh, and the, the, the individual is still not uh, well controlled in terms of their EIB and asthma, then you need to consider alternative diagnosis and if an exercise challenge hasn't been done, it should be done to verify the EIB. Uh, methacholine challenge would be for, for chronic asthma, uh, but it is not, it's not sensitive for EIB. And rhinolaryngoscopy to look for vocal cord dysfunction. And of course, your, your, your uh, candidates for EIB should be seen regularly uh, to see if your interventions are effective. So for mild intermittent EIB, a short-acting beta agonist, or even a long-acting beta agonist 15 minutes prior to exercise can be used up to three times a week. Uh, if used more than that, uh, this leads to tachyphylaxis and shortening of the period of, uh, of the duration of effectiveness of the therapy uh, and uh, uh, loss of the recovery from the fall in FEV1. Um, if you're if you have persistent asthma, an individual who is uh, having to use the short-acting or long-acting beta agonist up to three times a week or more and still not getting control, then you, you need to consider inhaled corticosteroids, um, which, which take about two to four weeks to work. Strength of the evidence here is, um, uh, recommendation here is, is uh, uh, high recommendation and moderate quality evidence. We've already talked about the non-pharmaceutical interventions, uh, but new data uh, from Brandon and colleagues in Australia uh, have disputed that fish oil um, is efficacious uh, for, uh, with, uh, for EIB. The original studies were done with fish oil, were done um, with uh, a placebo, uh, but were done in individuals with more marginal EIB. Uh, so it's uh, when... Uh, Brandon repeated the studies with individuals with mild, uh, moderate, and severe EIB, mild being 
up to 20 percent, moderate being 20 to 40, and severe being over 40 percent decline in FEV1. Um, uh, he could not document uh, any efficacy for fish oil supplementation. Now, the ATS guidelines then are that um, uh, persistent asthma, non-responsive to beta agonists that require more than three times a week, we should introduce inhaled steroids, um, allowing for two to four weeks for effic efficacy. And leukotriene modifiers should be introduced on a case-by-case -case basis. I'll show you the data from Stelmach and others that the most efficacious therapy for EIB with chronic asthma is an inhaled steroid such as budesonide um, together with um, uh, monolucast. Um, now your uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories such as chromalin and docromil, while efficacious um, given before exercise, last about two hours um, and are not available in the U.S. And the in inhaled uh, anticholinergic, we've said, uh, is efficacious really on a case-by-case -case basis. Inhaled beta agonists most effective for intermittent using use uh, providing two to four hours of protection against DIB and the recovery of EIB to baseline is when administered after decline in exercise. But we said that continuous use of beta agonists leads to tolerance um, or tachyphylaxis and even inhaled steroid addition does not change that. Question. Beta agonist alone is adequate therapy for EIB with asthma, either as needed or continuously. True or false? Audience response? False. False. That's right, because you lead, this leads to tolerance or tachyphylaxis. Uh, the pharmacologic treatment options for EIB we've already talked about, uh, short-acting beta agonists 15 minutes before exercise will prevent symptoms for three hours. Uh, LABAs uh, will take in greater than 30 minutes before exercise will prevent symptoms up to 12 hours. And mast cell stabilizers uh, will take in before exercise will last about two hours. Uh, the uh, this is an illustration of albuterol's efficacy, 100% efficacy. Um, uh, uh, in, in preventing decline in FEV1 as opposed to monolucast, which just improves the drop in FEV1 by 50%. Um, so a clinical response. Daily therapy with leukotriene modifiers is helpful. Um, there is no, there is no uh, tolerance with them. Uh, protection is not complete. As I said, it gives clinical protection, and there's no reversal of airway obstruction. Chromalin and docromol we've already discussed. Uh, and this is showing chromalin's uh, complete efficacy because it blocks the even 10% drop uh, in uh, it, it. It blocks uh, F, the FEV1 fall uh, to 10% or less, so complete uh, blockade. So chromalin and albuterol both are uh, completely protective against um, EIB, whereas monolucast is only uh, partially protective or, or clinically protective. Inhaled steroids in decrease the frequency and severity of EIB, but not acute therapy, and they do not prevent tolerance from beta agonist use. And this is one illustration of that. Anderson studies using cyclesonide in increasing doses, a 320 microgram dose for a period of four weeks, did lead to um, a statistically significant decline in the, in the, fall, in the fall in FEV1. Um, this is... Uh, Stelmach's work comparing budesonide plus formoterol, budesonide plus monolucast, monolucast, budesonide alone, and placebo and over a period of four weeks in children with EIB um, and asthma. And you can clearly see that the fall in FEV1 was not uh, as considerable with budesonide plus formoterol over four weeks versus budesonide and monolucast uh, or even monolucast or budesonide alone. Uh, and that, again, is because one gets um, tachyphylaxis with the addition of the beta agonist for a period of four weeks. And Duong and colleagues had a similar study uh, where they demonstrated that the most efficacious therapy for uh, EIB is the budesonide plus monolucast in terms of the fall in FEV1 or the area under the curve. 
And Stelmach demonstrated a similar finding with children adding uh, 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 monoleucase to seclesonide here and demonstrating that the fall in FEV1 uh, was mitigated uh, more considerably by adding leukotriene modifier uh, to the inhaled steroid versus the inhaled steroid alone or the inhaled steroid with a lava. And finally, in thorax, uh, there was a, a study that demonstrated uh, a combination of uh, budesonide and formoterol on demand improves asthma control and reduces EIB. And this is last slide before our concluding slides uh, is just uh, for um, knowledge. Um, the imitinib, which is a kid inhibitor uh, for severe refractory asthma, uh, in a study in a double-blind placebo-controlled trial of 24 weeks in 62 patients with severe refractory asthma and EIV, um, demonstrated decreased airway hyperresponsiveness, mast cell counts, and tryptase release. Uh, so it would be efficacious uh, for EIV, albeit uh, with severe refractory asthma, side effects, muscle cramps, and hypophosphatemia. So to summarize, um, you have a patient who presents with dyspnea, cough, wheezing, chest tightness, uh, in chest tightness during or after exercise that is not cardiopulmonary, cardio, uh, cardiac related, and you you perform a baseline resting FEV1. You administer a bronchodilator uh, to see if you get a response. If you do, you've diagnosed EIB with asthma, um, and you manage that individual with inhaled steroids or leukotriene modifier and, and short-acting beta agonist as needed. Um, and on the left-hand side of the diagram, uh, the uh, FEV1 uh, greater than 80 percent, uh, you do an indirect test. You do a dry air exercise challenge or you cap voluntary hyperpnea and establish that uh, EIV uh, via the challenge. Uh, and again, you start with a short-acting beta agonist and add the inhaled steroids and or, and or leukotriene modifiers until you get clinical improvement. So questions, EIB is differentiated from EIB with asthma by the presence, uh, by the absence of known <laughs> asthma, true or false? True. 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 EIB management is by limitation of training, true or false? Okay, no, it actually is true because it's EIB alone. Um, it, 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 is, it, it, it is by managed by limitation of training. Um, and your EIB with asthma is managed by controller medications, including steroids and PRN beta agonists, true or false? True. True. True, and again, you, you, you don't want to be using beta agonists continuously because of tachyphylaxis. EIB with and without known asthma uh, is common in, exa in at least 10 to 20 percent of the general population, up to 40 to 50 percent of allergic rhinitis patients, uh, and up to 90 percent of individuals with asthma. Uh, up to 50% of elite athletes will have EIB with or without known asthma. And it's exacerbated with allergens, which I didn't get into, and or irritants, and it's controlled with achievement of a healthy lifestyle. EIB with known asthma requires treatment for the entire airway. Uh, as I indicated, you need to evaluate inhalant allergy and be administering a nasal steroid uh, in conjunction with your treatment for asthma with a leukotriene modifier and or inhaled steroids or if non-steroidals are available in relevant training, and beta agonist is used only as needed. I'm going to stop there, and um, I'll take questions after the next slide. Um, EIB pathogenesis is postulated to be predominantly an osmotic effect of water loss, true or false? True. 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 Okay. Uh, that's, that's your test question. Uh, and the, the the diagnosis of VIB is by pre- and post-bronchodilator spirometry, um, or if this is not diagnostic, then an exercise challenge. True or false? True. 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 Okay. <laughs> and the recommended therapy for mild EIB is albuterol. True or false? True. 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 Okay. 
And I'll stop there and I'll take questions. Chris, this is Paul Dowling. I have a, a, a question. That article you just mentioned from Thorax where they used on-demand um, yeah. uh, budesonide for Moderol, did they do that same study with just for Moderol and just budesonide alone? No, no, they did not. I would think that no. you, if it's on demand, that the the effect would have been the same with just using for Moderol. Correct. That and that and that would be correct. But remember that uh, the uh, the um, uh, EIB is both a bronchoconstrictive and inflammatory process. Uh, so so that would be the logic in using a combination therapy, albeit PRN. Um, and obviously, you use it PRN uh, because. Uh, uh, you don't want to uh, risk uh, tachyphylaxis, um, and um, so so uh, the addition of the Pulmacort. Uh, Pulmacort has been shown to have uh, efficacy actually within hours, um, and it is used. Uh, I shouldn't say Pulmacort. I should say Budesonide. Uh, we don't use commercial names here. Uh, Budesonide is actually used for treatment of croup in the emergency rooms in Europe. Uh, because its onset of action is so rapid. Um, so there is a logic to using uh, budesonide plus formoterol, uh, even PRN. Um, uh, and, of course, it avoids tachyphylaxis. So the, the on demand, are you saying you use it four hours before you can exercise or what? Correct. Well, uh, that's correct. That's correct. Yes. The which obviously you have... go, go ahead. ahead sure I was just going to say which is which may not be very practical but uh, <laughs> so but go ahead sure um, the other question I had is um, I've, I've always I've been sort of amazed that when they redid the practice parameters they used 10 percent as a cutoff for exercise induced bronchospasm or bronchoconstriction because um, I've just when we do normal PFTs, we accept a five percent, um, you know, variation between your your FEV ones. So going to ten percent isn't very much from that, um, especially in kids where we see a lot of right. this in teenagers whose efforts in their spirometry are often all over the place and often, um, you know, hard to get them to be that consistent. So I would, I you know, when I was a fellow, it used to be fifteen percent. When we do methicolines, it's it's a PD twenty or PC twenty. Right. So correct. why did they, why did they <laughs> settle for only 10%? Uh, well, first of all, um, correction, uh, when we make the diagnosis of asthma, uh, we look for an FEV1 uh, uh, in, in improvement, remember, of 12% um, and a decline that is uh, uh, 12%. Um, so, um, uh, and the indeed, the methacholine uses a 20% cutoff. Um, the, the answer to your question is this is an area that is highly con contended um, and uh, in fact uh, I mentioned that the, the reason the EVH is not a gold standard is because there's a lot of noise um, with uh, EVH positivity and, and that's mainly in individuals who have FEV1 drops of about 10 to 15 percent. Um, so there is a heated debate about whether we should use uh, a 15% uh, or higher. And in, in fact, in one recent European study, uh, they used 20% cutoff uh, in FEV1. Um, but there is, there is equally um, disagreement at the other end. Uh, beautiful studies uh, done of elite athletes by Anderson and her colleagues um, it, it suggests that, there, that a cutoff of 7 to 10% uh, in the elite athlete uh, may be meaningful. So, so there's arguments at both ends, uh, and, and uh, that is probably why we, we've derived 10% as the cutoff in much the same way that the FEV1 of 12% was derived because uh, there were arguments for 10% and 15%. Um, so the compromise was 12. Um, so um, I, I share your point of view. I, I think that... Um, in our in our poster presentation on uh, uh, EIB at the college, uh, we make the point that um, the EVH is most predictable uh, when you're moderate to severe in terms of your EIB. That is, when your drop in FEV1 is greater than 20%. Um, so uh, 
but but again, there's controversy at both ends. Okay. Does, does that answer questions? your question? Yes, thank you. I was just wondering why chromalin and metachromal and Dr. why those aren't available anymore. Well, that's a very good question. Um, they, there was discussion. Uh, I was just discussing this with my Australian colleagues uh, in the last two months uh, of a um, uh, organization uh, of a corporation, uh, I believe a European, uh, which was going to take over Chromalin uh, and, uh, and begin to manufacture it again in the U.S. Um, but the answer to your question is that the uh, the the com company manufacturing chromalin in the U.S. Um, uh, has uh, essentially gone out of business, um, and it's not it's not efficacious. Uh, it's not um, it's not competitive uh, in the in the pharmaceutical market for asthma, except for EIB. I think some of that was also with the. Changing to HFAs, wasn't it? Um, it yes. Was yes, it was. Yep. They didn't have such a market share, and it was going to be so expensive that it wasn't worth it. I thought it wasn't worth it. That's exactly it. Yes, I mean, that's what I meant when I said it wasn't competitive. Um, yeah. So, um, but uh, but it is available in Canada. Um, and it's available here, and of course, in eye drop form. <laughs> uh, so you can you can get your chromalin eye drops. Uh, and, uh, one one of my colleagues was was looking at whether you could nebulize that. Uh, I don't believe you can. Uh, so uh, you can, but the question is, does it work? And does it work exactly? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yeah, that was one of my Australian colleagues looked at this. It's not very not very effective. Might be interesting because nasal chrome is still available. And, it is. Um, yeah. So you might be able to, you know, take like four sprays each nostril or something and, and exactly. see if that has an impact on your exercise. Yeah. Um, it, you can get the spin haler as well if you, um, you know, if you, if you want to. Uh, I mean, you can purchase that, um, but it's very, very cumbersome. Um, so, um, so otherwise you have to go to Canada. <laughs> so. Canada is very nice this time of year. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, it is. Um, We'll let you um, get back to work, Chris. Um, thank you very okay. much for taking time okay. out of your busy schedule to be with us this morning. And thanks for a great talk. Have a good weekend. Okay. All right. You too. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, okay. And and Jay, welcome back. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. And th thank you for the uh, uh, enjoyment of this discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.